Dr. Elaine Inyo. What comes to your mind? I will leave it open. Some of you guys read about her, her. some of you guys know a little bit of her. What, what is it about her that you know? Anybody, open it up. So, so, Go ahead, Drew. Raise your hand, please. Uh, the soil food web is what first comes to mind. The soil, the soil food web. The soil food web. What else? Active aerated compost tea. <laughs> compost tea. Director of Rodeo Institute. Director of Rodeo Institute. Fungi and bacteria. Fungi and bacteria. It comes to your mind. What, what else? Making soil science accessible to the lay person. Making it accessible to the lay person. What else? Okay. You know, when when um, I went to her workshop, and I think there were about 300 people there, yeah, in Hilo. I think about four months ago. How many of you guys were part of that? You know, and that came out only about a week and a half before she came over, and it was just barraged by so many people. So I figured, oh, I better jump on this bed and check it out, you know. So we brought about four people from from Kohala, and, and I sat down, I listened to her, I said, wow, there's so much to be learned. Um, and you can't do it in only three hours. Yeah, or four hours at that time. And I, I thought, you know, there's some way in which we can bring her back. So uh, we we try to put some some funding together uh, through uh, Leeward Community College that, that contributed some sustainable Kohala, uh, Kahanaloya Partners in Development. Uh, a, a, a little bit of funding came from um, Nona South uh, Luce, you know, uh, from her farm. Um, and <laughs> and, and then from FFA Foundation, away FFA Foundation. So with that, we're able to jump a little bit and and uh, be able to bring her here to Hawaii. You know, Nona. How many of you know Nona? Nona and Nona looks. She's uh, you know um, very very active in in this initiative with organic farming and, and natural farming. And unfortunately, uh, she lost her husband. You know, uh, about a week ago, and Firo was was uh, two days ago. And, and uh, Leon was a strong proponent of soil science. He was going to come over to do a sample of composting. And the day that he was supposed to come over. I had some clippings ready for him and I didn't hear from him so I said, oh, what's up, you know. Um, and then I found out a couple of days later that Nona lost Leon. But uh, he was supposed to be here and, and uh, he took a couple of classes from, from uh, Dr. Lay. And Dr. Lay, you know, emailed Nona um, several days ago and said, should we cancel the class? And Nona said, no, let's move on. So, uh, I like you, you know, I, I know many of you guys know her, if you don't know her, uh, or don't know Leon, you know, uh, Leon is a special person, so, um, just keep him in your, in your heart, keep her in your heart, and, and uh, just wish you well, you know, and uh, I, I just wanted to share that, and maybe just have about two minutes of silence for that.
Here's a baby I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 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 I'm
as compared to shrubs, as compared to trees. You want to select for trees, you have to get the right balance of the organisms. If you've got a balance that selects for weeds, guess what you're going to be growing? So if what's growing in your yard right now, and what's growing in your agricultural fields is a whole set of weeds, Mother Nature's trying to tell you there's a problem. And you are not going to be able to easily grow any other kind of plant in that system. So how do we alter that biology? Who is it that performs what jobs and what functions? So when we're thinking about this food web, the benefits, well, first and foremost is what I just talked about. You're going to select the growth of the plant you want, whatever it might happen to be. If you want strawberries, if you want avocados, if you want to grow dandelions, and there are people who do, so you just need to get that balance of the organisms right so the plant you want to grow is the one that's going to be healthy and happy and not sick. Let's have our weeds be the things that are being attacked by disease-causing fungi and disease-causing insects instead of the plant you want to grow. So leading right into that suppressing disease and pest organisms. Who is it that does this job and what are the mechanisms for why that works? And so over the next couple of days we're going to be exploring that aspect. But that's just one tiny little thing of what your food web is actually going to do for you. Third thing is to <coughs> soil structure. And this right here has a lot of consequences that most people don't really understand. We have to build soil structure so our roots can go deep. When we start looking at how deep are the roots in the lawn outside, if we go out here to this lawn, and I look at the species of grass that's growing in this lawn, and I shudder because this is not a real friendly black grass. This is not really something that if you've got this in your pasture, you're not going to be growing very good animals because it does not have the nutrition in it that your animals require. We want to shift the species to a more productive, better for the general health of your animals than this particular species. Well, how do we do that? Well, bingo, we're going right back there. Get the balance right. But if you dug into this soil and you pulled up uh, you know, some soil, looked at that profile, how far down in the soil are the root systems of these grasses going? inches, maybe max. <laughs> Your plant is A, not getting much water. You're going to have to constantly water it. Well, here on this part of the island, that's kind of like you know, a big deal. Uh, you're getting water all the time. Oh, wait a minute, maybe you aren't. Certain times of the year, you got real problems keeping this grass alive because you're not getting constant rainfall. Over the last two days that I've been here, there's been constant rainfall, but not going to extend throughout the whole growing season. So we want those roots going deeper. If our roots go deeper, we're going to get water. You are not going to have to water your plants. If we get the biology in your soil right, we will reduce water use by up to 70% as compared to a conventional system. Several reasons for that, and I want to go through the reasons. I want you to leave here understanding how to fish and not just me handling fish. Now, same thing as any true teacher wanting to teach you the reasons why something and not just stand up here and make your promises. You need to understand how these things come about. How do we get the roots growing deeper? How do we hold water in the soil so that water is present? How far down can the roots of Bermuda grass go? When we're looking at Zoysia, six feet. Why is your root system only going down a couple inches? What have we been doing to our soils? And so understanding the problems that we as human beings have been imposing. It may not be you that did the damage. You inherited it. 
from whoever had your property less, last. And it may be damage that started 100 years ago. It may be damage that's 75 years old. It may be 50 years old. It may be 20, whatever. We've got to deal with the problem and get rid of that problem. How do you get rid of the toxic chemicals? How do you get rid of the salts? How do you get rid of compaction? And how are we imposing compaction? Even in the world of organic farming, we are still allowing compaction to be imposed on our soils way too much. So what's the practical and easy way of getting away from compassion? What causes compassion? Lots of things. So we want to have our roots growing down deep so they will get the water. And if we can get break up that compaction, get the roots growing deep, they are going to get all the mineral nutrients that your plant requires. There is no plant, there is, there is no soil, there is no agricultural soil in the United States that lacks the nutrients to grow your plants. There is absolutely no reason to be putting on inorganic fertilizers of any kind. If you have the right biology in your soil, inorganic fertilizers thrown out the window because they are pointless and useless and they are destroying the very life that you require. Got to stop doing that. Got to stop destroying that life so we can get all the normal nutrients cycling. There is no soil on this island that lacks the nutrients to grow your plants. Ooh, but you know, every time we harvest our plants, we're taking off the mineral and the nutrition, we're taking it someplace else, so we're mining nutrients out of our soils. How do you put them back? Well, what the nutrients already got them in your soil for you? You have a million years worth of nutrients in the sand, silt, and clay that is already present in your soil. There's no need to add more as long as you have the biology to take it from that mineral pool and convert it into a plant available pool. And I'll go over this a couple more times during the next couple of days. But when you start looking at a soil chemistry report, what are you told about? Of the mineral nutrients that are in your, present in your soil, what are you being informed about on that soil chemistry report? You're being told about less than 1% of the actual nutrients present in your soil. You are only told about the soluble, inorganic forms of any nutrient you want to talk about. Are there other nutrients in your soil? Oh, yeah, the other 99.9%. This is all you're told about on a soil chemistry report. Forget about the nutrients in bacteria, fungi, protozoic, nematodes, in your root systems, in the organic matter that's present. You're only being told about what the chemical guys want to tell you about so they can convince you to buy some chemical fertilizers. If I tell you that uh, your bananas require 150 parts per million nitrate in order to grow, but right now your soil only has two parts per million nitrate, see how easy it is to convince you you've got to go out and buy an inorganic nitrogen fertilizer? <gasps> Otherwise your plants are not going to be able to live. They're not going to be able to grow. So how do uh, bananas manage to stay alive out in the real world? Nobody's putting inorganic fertilizers on them out in natural systems. If they're growing just fine, in most cases they're growing better than what we've got in our chemical system. How do you explain that? Oh, well, you know, uh, we've got to have higher production. No, no, no. The trees out in the natural system, higher production than most of our agricultural systems. Where are we going wrong? What we're losing in our agricultural systems is the biology to convert the total nutrients, so total nutrients present in your soil only become available to your plant if you have the bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods, mycorrhizal fungi, or plants, those critters present in your soil. Exactly how does that work? What do we have to have? And who's feeding the bacteria and fungi in order for them to take the mineral nutrients out of your rocks, 
out of your sand, out of your silt, out of your clay particles. One grain of sand in most soils is probably going to provide all the nutrients that your crop requires in this whole acre for the next week. One grain of sand is all you need. Well, okay, but you got to disperse the nutrients in that grain of sand to all of the whole acre. Now there's a little bit of a challenge. So instead, let's take all the sand in your acre and just a little bit of it being made available to your plant every day, all day, all the time. As long as we've got that biology in the soil, that's what we're doing. Bacteria and fungi mineralize it or pull those mineral nutrients out of the sand, silt, clay, organic matter, out of your rocks, out of your pebbles. And then as long as we have protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods, to eat those bacteria and fungi, they release those nutrients in the plant available form. How good are we at supplying exactly the right set of nutrients to your plant today? <coughs> what are you growing? Um, we're all currently I got a bunch of bananas and some chicken So what does, your, what does your banana need today? Do you know? Um, no, not very much. Yeah, your plant doesn't talk to you like that, does it? It doesn't say, uh, hey, all right, today I need some calcium. Um, right now I better have a little bit more boron and could you please send down more zinc? Mm -hmm. And even if we could, you know, listen and hear that from our plants, how good are we at putting on calcium? or zinc, or boron, or whatever your plant needs and getting it dispersed through that root system. We are not, are we? We're pretty hopeless about that. And yet, that's kind of what the chemical world is saying to you. Ooh, poor Mother Nature, she doesn't understand how to do this. <laughs> so we're going to have to help her. And we're going to have to go out there and provide the nutrients that your plant requires when we have no clue what your plant requires today. What's the limiting nutrient? Yeah, there is a limiting nutrient, but which one is it? And you don't know. So maybe the plant has figured out a system to make those total nutrients become available and exactly the concentration that plant requires on a second-by-second -second basis. What is that system? And so we're going to be going there over the next couple days. How do you make certain that your plant is going to get precisely what it needs and those nutrients are delivered to the root system. Your plant is going to call up, hello pizza delivery guy, I want double cheese and extra sauce on my pizza and I want it delivered to whatever the address is. And that's what your plant is basically doing in it when it puts out exudates to feed those bacteria and fungi to get them to solubilize the mineral nutrients from that sand, silk, clay, organic matter, rocks, or um, um, pebbles in your soil. It's happening right in the root system. So along come the protozoa, the nematodes, the microarthropods, the earthworms, eat the bacteria and fungi and deliver to the door precisely what your plant requires. So let's get to the, the total information, get through that whole system. So when we remove plant material from our soils, are we taking off some nutrients? Sure. But how does Mother Nature replenish those nutrients in your soil on a day-by-day -day basis? Always and forever breaking down the bedrock into sand, silt, and clay. And it is the microorganisms in your soil that break down your bedrock. There's some pretty interesting studies coming out of the University of Helsinki in Finland showing that abiotic factors are not the most important thing in mineralizing bedrock and turning it into sand, silt, clay. Every second of every day, bedrock is being broken down and your soil is experiencing new, fresh sand, silt, clay. Always continuously replenishing that in your soil. So until the day your soil runs out of sand, silt, and clay, there is no need to put on inorganic anything. As long as you have the life in the soil. Kill the life? Yeah. Now you better be looking at those inorganic fertilizers. Get the life back in the soil. Stop worrying about it. You don't have to be responsible for supplying the mineral nutrition to your plant. Your plant can do it itself. 
question here. Can I um, put the word lava in bedrock because I live on lava? Yep. Yeah. So but this one is lava. Yeah. It's bedrock. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not living in Just yes. further along. Yep. So it's been melted. It was brought up to a really high temperature, but it's molten rock. And so it's poured out of the center of the earth. What's the probability that that lava contains all the mineral nutrients your plant requires? And the only way to get those mineral nutrients into a plant available form is to make sure you have the right biology. So how many times have you been walking along with some lava flow and, and here's a palm tree grown out of, it looks like bare mineral rock. Uh, start looking down there. Look at where that uh, seed fell and what's the habitat that that seed actually germinated and started to grow. There's organic matter. So that organic matter with the life on it had to blow in from someplace else. Of course, that's where the seeds, when they fall in that little pocket of organic matter, that's where they get started. And we start converting that lava into soil. Because now you've got biology being fed by the plant. Breaking nutrients down, doing the nutrient cycling. So we've got some great little microsites in lava flows. So building soil structure, it takes biology to do that. We have to have a good structure here. So oxygen can move down into your soil. What's so important about oxygen? Because it's only under anaerobic conditions that the disease-causing fungi, the disease-causing bacteria, the pests survive, outcompete the good guys, and then, of course, attack and consume your root systems. So it's critically important in all of this that we stay aerobic. And that's one thing that hasn't been very well understood by soils people over the last, hmm, forever. So, Understanding what conditions select for the good guys and what selections, what conditions select for the bad guys is critically important here. It's the aerobic organisms that benefit your plant. It's the anaerobic organisms that produce some of the most plant toxic materials you want to talk about. And so we need to understand that. We will go through that set of information. We have to keep things aerobic so the life in the soil can do the job it's supposed to do. Well, decomposition is another really important factor. All that dead plant material needs to decompose. And so we will talk about different kinds of nutrients. We will talk about different types of food resources for bacteria. When we are looking at decomposition, decomposition ought to be happening quite rapidly. It's one way of telling whether you have the biology in your soil. Do you have all the organisms? Then decomposition is going to proceed rapidly. If you don't have the good organisms in your soil, then the residues just sit and look at you for the rest of forever. If you don't have bacteria and fungi, those materials never decompose, they never go away. If we didn't have those decomposers, all of us would be buried miles deep in plant, dead plant material. And then what about all the nutrients in that dead plant material? It's stuck at that stage. How could you get those nutrients back into the next set of plants if you don't have decomposition occurring? So start paying attention to how rapidly your residues from any of your crops, from any of your plants, how rapidly do they decompose? And so we understand what kinds of organisms decompose, what kinds of materials, you don't really need to find out an understanding of what's going on in your soil. So see, after you've taken this course, I expect all of you to go out and give this lecture to everybody else that you know. Yeah, that's the plan. Go out and do that. So make sure that you're understanding this information. When you get home tonight, go back through your notes. Can you give this talk? 
in your own words, could you do this for other people? Because uh, it's the point that I'm here for, is to teach all of you to go for it and infect everybody else. <laughs> Decomposition, really an important factor in all of this as well. So nutrient cycling, plant production, it's really critically important to understand the biology in your soil because we can't be sustainable without this knowledge. We stop using organic fertilizers. I will tell you absolutely, if you kill the biology in the soil, the only way to grow your plants is to use those inorganic fertilizers, to use those pesticides, and destroy water quality, and destroy your soil, and produce plant material that has no nutritional value for your animals or for yourself. How long is man, the human race, going to continue to exist on this planet if we continue to destroy our soil and our water? Now, we're facing certain extinction. So maybe it's time to get going so we can truly be sustainable. And we all have to help on this. We all have to be part of spreading the knowledge. So, let's look at what some of these different critters look like. How do they move? How are we going to help identify them in our soils? So, starting with chapter one, and I put these chapter breaks into my talk that help me to remember to say, any questions? Have I, have I got you confused totally yet, or it's flowing pretty well? Question. It's a quick one, just because in point three you're saying that aerobic organisms are important. Um, does that also correlate to aerobic decomposition versus anaerobic decomposition? Yep. You want your decomposition to be aerobic. Compost is, by definition, the oxidative decomposition of a mix of organic materials. Oxidative. Even if the compost is done and it comes from an anaerobic digester, you wouldn't be as excited about it as if it were aerobic. So the anaerobic material coming out of an anaerobic digester is severely anaerobic. What are you going to do to get all this decomposition that's going to subsequently happen aerobic again? Because boy, that stuff coming out of that anaerobic digester, do you have some disease causing organisms in there? Do not touch that and then lick your fingers. That's you, it's going to be dead. Really nasty creators in that anaerobic material. Pests, problems, some very plant um, toxic materials in that anaerobic. Have you ever taken material from an anaerobic digester and put it on a plant? Yeah, how long did it take to kill it? Yeah. <laughs> and you're lucky your plant held out for a long time, so the soil is actually in pretty good shape until you put that anaerobic stuff on the surface. This is the same from like biogas, whatever it is. Yep, anything when so, we're talking about anaerobic decomposition. Oh, why do they hype it up? <laughs> Who's making all this money? Anaerobic decomposition. Yeah. 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 Would they tell you that there's huge problems with the I mean, end of the material? You're on the Cusco thing where it doesn't make any money whatsoever. Well, but they're still selling you information. They're selling you units. They're selling you all kinds of things. So it's anaerobic. I mean, can you get it? Well, you can right. make it good again. <clears throat> yeah. Well, okay. Let's. What kind of plants would grow well with an anaerobic? Nope, nothing. Sorry. <laughs> Some of the most de most uh, toxic plant um, materials that we know for, for plants and for human beings. So we've got to get it aerobic again. Can you take extremely anaerobic materials and convert it back again into aerobic? Sure. But, I love that particular but in there. <laughs> When we go anaerobic, so I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but under anaerobic <coughs> conditions, any of your soluble inorganic nitrogen has been lost as ammonia. Yes. Bye. How many of you are going to grow plants with no nitrogen left in the material? Yeah, so if we use that stuff where most of your nitrogen's gone bye bye, we're going to have to put some leggings in there. We're going to have to put some nitrogen fixing plants back into the system. So, probably want to think about that. Under anaerobic conditions, any of the inorganic soluble forms of sulfur have been converted into hydrogen sulfide. Gas, say goodbye, it's gone. 
How many of you know what ammonia smells like? And if you're in doubt, go to the grocery store, open up the little can of, you know, the bottle of ammonia. <laughs> Hydrogen sulfide, what does that smell like? Amaze, yeah, the smell of fire and brimstone. So, you blast your sulfur. Can your plants grow without any sulfur in the material? Yeah. Not happening, is it? So, if it's gone anaerobic, where you need to have your nutrients gone? Under anaerobic conditions, your phosphorus is going to be blown off as PO, uh, excuse me, the PO4 is going to be lost as phosphine gas. Ooh, gas. It's going off into the atmosphere. Phosphine gas. How many of you have ever gone out to a swamp in the dark of the moon and you've seen those little clouds of kind of yellow, white, green colored clouds of gas coming off the surface of the soil? Will o' the wisps, fairy lights, swamp gas. Yeah, that's your phosphine. There's your phosphorus. Say goodbye to it. Swamps and there goes your phosphorus. So yeah, if we're not dealing with soil, if we're dealing with anaerobic sediments, uh, look out. If, that's, if you're growing in old mangrove swamp areas, look out. You are going to be dealing with a situation where we don't have nitrogen, we don't have sulfur, we don't have phosphorus in our soil. So we're going to have to do something to put them back. And what is the most complete form of hmm, fertilizer? To put all of these elements back in at the same time in the proper balances to grow your plants. Um, good compost. Aerobic compost. Through the composting process where we decompose that plant material, we're blowing off a portion of the carbon as CO2. We're concentrating everything else. So is compost actually a fertilizer? Look out for the legal definition of fertilizer. Because no, it's not a fertilizer. It's an organic amendment. It contains all the nutrients your plants require in the proper balances already. It's not like, oh, let's see, I have to pour some nitrate fertilizer on there. Okay, you've got all the nitrate in the soil, your plants are taking up excess amount of nitrate, but what other nutrients are now out of whack and out of balance? Of course, you grow for your plant and it's weak. It doesn't have the proper balance of nutrients for that plant. Going in aerobic, whoops, not a good idea. Look at what happens to pH when we go anaerobic. Because only under anaerobic conditions do we produce a really nasty set of organic acids. Really nasty. And organic acids are going to drop the pH of your soil, of your compost, of your liquid. It will eventually drop your pH and that material down to two. How many of you can grow plants at a pH of two? No. Happening. What's the pH range that your plant can grow? Depends on the plant. Bingo! Depends on the plant. Woo Look out. The answer to any question I ask you is it depends. <laughs> <laughs> Always six. It depends. Okay, what does it depend on? Well, with plants, when I ask that question, what's the pH over which plants grow? The pH is anywhere between 5.5 and 11. I'm sorry. All plants. Pretty much can do just fine over that pH range. This is not the limiting factor. So, why do soils people tell you that the pH that plants grow best is 6.5? Because that's where most of the elements are available. That's what you hear from soils people. At a pH of 6.5, maybe 6.8, that's where most of the elements are most. Available. So you can go look at your little chart and tell me if that's true. I'll pull up that chart probably tomorrow afternoon sometime. Okay, the rules here, just to take a little divot. The rules here are that when your cell phone goes off, that means everybody who's in the room and has to listen to that now gets a free beer from you. <laughs>
So, we take samples of your soil. So, come Friday, we'll be taking samples from this compost, and we're going to look at exactly what's going on and what the organisms are in here. So, we've wetted this up a little bit because the organisms in your compost and your soil like their life to be around 30 to 50 percent moisture. So, we wetted it a little up a little bit. We'll find out what organisms start growing in this composting material. We will mix this up really well, and then we'll pull out about one teaspoon of this material. And this will go into a little test tube, so David, I'm gonna need you to find some test tubes for Friday. It's really nice to have a mark on the side with a one millimeter, milliliter increments. Um, what I find for the general public is uh, medicine spoons. Go to the pharmacy and ask for some of the medicine spoons that you, you know, Open kid, here's your cough medicine, and uh, drink it on down. So nice uh, demarcations on the side. So you fill that up, one gram or one milliliter cubic centimeter volume with your sample. So it can be compost, it could be your soil, it could be your tea, your extract, it could be your uh, yogurt, it could be your kenge, whatever you want to look at the organism one milliliter or one gram of material at the bottom of that spoon. And now we're going to add water to it. So we typically start out by diluting it one to five. And then we shake. So you want to shake like this for about 30 seconds. So you go from, you go from the top of your circle to a quarter of the way down and back in one second. So one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, or if you're like me, I've got second hand on my one. So it that was a little slow. So now there's one second from here, there, and back. We don't want to break the organisms up. We don't want to smack them up against the side of the top of that test tube or the bottom and kill them. And we're going it's like this. Think about yourself. If you were on the ocean and somebody scooped you up and put you in a test tube and started doing this to you, how many of you would live through this experience? <laughs> Not. So don't do it to your organisms. We want that gentle shaking so we break up the water stable aggregates. Now we're going to take our microscope slide. And we're going to take an eyedropper. And you know, rinse that eyedropper up and down a couple of times and put one drop of that liquid, one to five dilution on our microscope slide. Cover slip, cover that water so it's a nice uniform depth of water and now we're going to look at it using our microscopes. Now this is 400 total magnification. <coughs> this is not outrageously high. This is, you know, you, a microscope like this typically costs about 250 to $300. With camera, $300. So any of you might want to buy your own microscopes. It's not that expensive. So we're going to be looking at this sample, and we're focused on the critters. What critters are we looking at? Most of the general public doesn't remember back to high school biology, and what critters we might be looking at in here. So let's go through this. We have a nice aggregate, and what we have are a whole bunch of bacteria, some rod shape, some cocci, some are slightly smaller cocci, bigger cocci, rods, in here, and then you've got some organic matter in there, they've got some silt, some clay, some sand sometimes as well, so there's a silt particle, a little bit out of focus, sorry. But that aggregate is built by the bacteria making glue, and they're gluing materials in there, grabs some of that good organic matter going by, and glues it up next to the body. And then it's going to grab a clay particle because it needs those minerals, it's going to solubilize the nutrients right out of that clay, so the carbon, the nutrients in the, in the clay, and the bacteria start growing. We have one bacteria, now we have two. 20 minutes later, we're going to have four. 20 minutes later, we have 16. 20 minutes later, we have 84. 20 minutes later, we have 1,000, um, 80, whatever it is. So see how fast you can go from one bacteria to billions, Very rapid, as long as you got food. So we're looking at color in these aggregates. And then it's telling you something about the organic matter in this sample. 
The dark color, see how this is a nice chocolate brown color? This is not black, it's chocolate brown. The color that we really want to have here is a deep, rich, dark chocolate color. So I will recommend to you that you go to the grocery store and you buy your own color chart. Very simple to find. Walk up to the chocolate bar counter <laughs> and grab a chocolate bar that is 70% cocoa. And now that's the color that you want to see in your soil when we're talking about good human gases, saving the count of nutrients and food for the best fungi that you can grow in your soil. We want our compost to be this color. We want our soil to be this color. If your soil is black, oops, it went anaerobic. Is it still anaerobic? No, so we'll talk about that on a day we uh, a little bit later, probably today. So more on that note. Now see some of this is kind of a tan color? Those are fulvic acids. They're not as complex. They're not as good a storage compound. So this is like having your savings account, which is your humic acid, and then you've got your money not market. And there's your folix, your true savings account, you don't touch it. That's the difference. Not quite as complex, a little easier to use. Aggregate, built by bacteria, beginning to build structure. <coughs> if these particles were evenly spread, you would have a really difficult time getting oxygen or water to move through this area. But when it all gets glued together by your bacteria, now we have plenty of space, plenty of place for water and oxygen to move into that soil, keeping it aerobic. So your roots can go as down as deep as they want. We can build structure in a compacted soil. We can go in and fix this if we have a biology. Then we have to have fungi. And they're going to take each one of those micro aggregates and bind them together into these macro aggregates. So it's the fungal hyphae that are binding these together. So I don't have a picture of the fungi here, but they are what bind your micro aggregates into macro aggregates. So building structure in your soil, oxygen and water can go down as deep as it needs to go. So by looking at this drop of material, we can already say, We've got pretty good structure in this soil. Look at the humix, look at the fulvix. This is probably pretty good soil. So we got lots of bacteria, so you can see these little bacteria. They're a little out of focus. We've got uh, aggregates here. This right, what the heck is that? That's a root. So you can see the individual root cells. So you can see that there are a number of cells within that root. Browner color, that means it's an older root. It's at least a year old when it's got superized material in it there like that. But then look at this divot right here. See how it's black right there? We have some necrosis happening. This root is being attacked by a fungus that's going to kill the plant. So just by looking at your materials, look at your roots. When you're looking at your soil samples, Look at the roots, scan along your root system and see if you have places where some organism has munched, where some fungus is starting to decompose. And you got to get a heads up, a warning. Something's really wrong with my soil and I maybe need to fix it. And then we have this critter. How many of you have noticed him? Yeah, kind of cute with these little legs coming off of there. This is a type of protozoan, the particular kind of protozoan that it is, is a cilia. So protozoa is the um, plural, protozoan is the singular, and the particular kind of protozoan is a cilia. And these guys are the bad news in your soils. If you see more than a few, you, know, you can get away with one or two. In your drop of water that's sitting on the microscope, you can see one or two of these and kind of go, okay, we're, we're probably still okay. But like in this sample, there were hundreds. 
the ciliates in this drop of water. And the ciliates prefer anaerobic conditions. So they are a good indicator that your soil is going south. You're about to have a disease outbreak because those disease causing fungi, bacteria, are going to be taken out of your, your root system. Well, we already have confirmation of that in this picture. You already have, you can see the physical evidence that this cilia is giving you. So ciliates can't compete with the aerobic protozoa. If it's aerobic at all, the ciliates go right to sleep. They insist. They insist on insisting. And that allows the flagellates, the good guy protozoa, and the amoebae to take over and do all the nutrient cycling that our plants require. Yeah, ciliates do do nutrient cycling. They are eating bacteria and releasing plant available nutrients, it's just that they're winning in the condition of anaerobic. And that means your nitrogen is going away, your phosphorus is going away, your sulfur is going away, your acids are starting to increase, and we're making some plant toxic materials when you see lots of ciliates. Ciliates, single cell, they eat bacteria. So look inside that guy, can you see all the bacteria inside his body? So, you know, seeing whatever's out here, that's what he's been chowing down on. That's what keeps him alive and happy. And you see all those little legs. He uses them like oars. I think of ciliates as being like Roman gallons. A bunch of slaves sitting at the bench and throwing along. And these guys zoom. And you watch them going through your um, sample and they're like, <laughs> Two anaerobic very rapidly. And uh, 
ciliates will be a good indicator that that's starting to happen. If you're using your microscope, say like on a daily or every two or three day basis, monitoring what's going on in your compost pile, you can see if you start to go anaerobic. And then you've got plenty of time to fix the problem before you destroy all your good guys. Question. If your nose indicates anaerobicity, is it already too late? Or? It's already too late, typically. Your nose is a little bit slow at, uh, because the anaerobic materials have to accumulate to a certain level in the pile and start leaving at a high enough concentration that we will detect it. And quite often, we're not that good at detecting it. So microscope is better? Microscope is better as a um, indicator that things are going south. pH is, you know, everything's all over once pH starts to drop. It's not a good indicator at all. It's a, yeah, it's dead, it's gone. Time to take it down, start over again. So ciliates, indicator that things are going south. As you start to see ciliates in something, yeah, you've got a little bit of time, you've got maybe a day to do something about it before things get just too far. And of course, there's always a temperature effect. The hotter it is, the faster these problems develop and become un unsolvable. The cooler it is, the more time you're going to have to deal with the problem. So there's always a temperature um, relationship. We want to be looking at species as well as individuals. So let's go back to that previous slide as you read this over in your notes. Go back to the previous slide and look at the fact that most of the bacteria you see in here are just one species. Lots of individuals, but there's only one species. In the aggregates, we've got some uh, rock-shaped bacteria. But again, only, <coughs> only one species. We ought to be seeing in a gram of good soil, there should be 75,000 species of bacteria. 75,000. And we can see two. So now could there be several species of little cocci that are all the same size? Yeah. But the fact that we're seeing just two different kinds of morphologies here is an indicator that uh, this is not the biology in it that we want. So we want to be seeing several different species differentiating them by morphology. And I always have thought from the soils people that say, but you can't tell anything based on morphology. Uh, wait a minute. Look at the person next to you. How do you know that's a person? <laughs> Did you check out their DNA? Did you ask for a, you know, a mouth swab and check? Uh, is that a human uh, cell that you're looking at? We know that you are a human being because, well, I suspect pretty strong. He's got a head, he's got two arms, he's got legs, eyes, nose, mouth, ears. What else would it be? It's a human being. We tell everything based on morphology. It's how all scientists classify organisms of any kind based on morphology. If it looks massively different, then it probably is a different species. Now, you know, you can look at some different characteristics. She's got, you know, the blonde hair, blue eye, kind of Northern European. So, okay, we can tell some ethnic characteristics based on morphology. I think you probably came from Southeast Asia somewhere, you know, probably pretty safe, you know. <laughs> <laughs> sure about that and now we can tell a little bit more that he's from some particular part of the planet based on the morphology. So morphology is very useful. We can tell a lot based on what it looks like. So how many species of bacteria? Oh, that's not many. We didn't have any fungi in that picture. We uh, need lots of individuals and we need lots of species. That's what we want to be looking at. So now Another soil. Again, what is this? That's an aggregate. Micro aggregate, because all I can see here are all those little green bits, those are bacteria. And it's pretty much one species of bacteria in there. Um, have they glued into this aggregate? Have they glued some <coughs> resource in there for themselves? Yeah, there's some humic in there, there's some fulvic. So those are pretty happy bacteria. Growing away. So 
So we have uh, you know, all these different bacteria. So individual bacteria, you can see that this guy is a little bit longer than he is wide. So we call him a cocobacillus. He's a round rod. Oh, scientists, you gotta love us, don't you? <laughs> cocobacillus, a round rod. So when we're talking about that word, bacillus, it's <coughs> Roman, it's more Greek, uh, for Roman, uh, Latin, that's what I was thinking of. That's Latin for rod. It's a rod-shaped organism. Coxa, or singular, coccus, plural, coxi, more than one. That just means round. So when we're talking about streptococcus, Caucus, that means round, but was, what does strepto mean? How many of you are not remembering your Latin from grade school? Oops, none of you took Latin. I did. <laughs> Tells you how old I am, doesn't it? Strepto, streptococcus, caucus, you know that bacterium that causes all that strep throat problem? It's, this means chains. So streptococcus, chains of little round bacteria. Those are definitely in pathogens. You see something like that in one of your samples, you want to make sure you wash your hands really well before you come anywhere close to food. You know, so immediately you can start saying in some of these samples, when you really need to be careful with this stuff, and where it doesn't matter. You know, go ahead and have some fun with this uh, compost because we haven't found anything bad in here yet. So, um, I'll go ahead and play in compost and then go to lunch. <laughs> Just add a little extra diversity to my digestive system. Doesn't bother me unless I see you know, something bad in my sample. So, what are we looking What else is in here? Well, we've got those nice aggregates. Humic acid, fulvic acid, a bigger aggregate, a bigger one, a bigger one. All of these things were held together by this strand. You can see where some of this is out of focus. So out of focus here. This is a fungus. This is a strand of fungus. So fungi come as these pipes, as these threads. And one of the characteristics of fungi is its uniform diameter all the way along that strand. Now, if you get out of here and you go, gosh, is, is this really a fungus? Is this part of it? We're going to have to focus. That's why we have focusing mechanisms on our microscope. So you follow along and make sure that that really is uniform diameter all the way along. So it meets the definition of fungus. Now, the best fungi are going to be the ones that are wide diameter. So the wider diameter, the more likely it's going to be a beneficial fungus. So diameter. Okay, well, where are the limits? What's the good? What's the bad? So all our good guy, beneficial fungi, have a diameter greater than 3 <coughs> micrometers. The okay ones at somewhere between 2.5 and 3 micrometers diameter, and almost invariably, the bad guys, the disease causing, and of course anything causes disease has to be a bad guy, have diameters typically around 2.0. So now they're at a really narrow diameter, we are probably dealing with a disease causing fungus. Not all of them are disease causers, but they're almost all of them. Another factor that we want to be looking at is color. And again, that nine, that 70% cocoa color, excellent fungi. So if I put the color down here, we've got our 70% cocoa, it's gotta be a good guy. There is no way that a nice brown colored fungus could cause disease. We just don't find them causing diseases. They might be secondary invaders, but they don't cause the death of a plant. It's the clear ones. It's the ones that aren't colored. 
and we call those in the world of science high line. Just means clear. Again, go back to your um, Latin. Hyaline, hyaline. What's the actual pronunciation? No, well, Latin's a dead language, so God only knows. <laughs> so there you are. It just means clear. Can you find some disease happening <laughs> in this picture? Yeah. Yeah, right here. That guy right there. He's a little out of focus. But see how narrow the diameter he is? And he's clear. He's colorless. This one is here. Nice dark brown, pretty good diameter. It's got to be the back of this. Now, how about this guy right here? How many of you found him? See that he's wider in diameter than this guy, but he's clear. So, is he good or is he bad? It depends. Yeah, it depends. <laughs> Because we've got other beneficials in here. 
Now, what if we killed off fungi using a fungicide? Of all these fungi in this sample, who's going to survive fungicide treatment? The pathogen. We have selected, through the use of our fungicides, for species of Pythium phytophthora, Rhizoctonia fusarium, Old Cylinder Carbon, Armillaria, you know, all of the bad guys. We have resistant strains. We use uh, fungicides, we've wiped out our control mechanism. We've destroyed our ability to control that disease causing fungus. And now that disease causing fungus, is he happy to wipe out your system? Who's fault? That we have these problems. We've destroyed the mechanism by which nature controls these problem organisms. Can you get these organisms, these good guys, back into your soil? Yeah. Now, what's it called that we use? Compost. Properly made aerobic compost. How easy is this to put back in the mechanisms to deal with the diseases and the pests in the compost? Well, I did the natural farming trial, and it was very curious because plants were doing very well with this item before. And soil treatment solution and sprays. But then Tim said to me, You need to make this uh, compost. <laughs> it was called, it was called uh, fermented compost. And as soon as I put the fermented compost up, things started, started turning around. But why, what I'm curious about is when we make the first IMO, it's almost like a petri dish. You put rice, and then I could just it should be white. So I'm curious, you're sad. I'm a little confused. We have to even set if it's if it's dark. If it's you know got a lot of dark brown or green. Throw it out. It's starting to get just what? <clears throat> what you're seeing with your eyeballs when you look at fungi with your eyes, they may be very white in appearance because you notice on the this fungal hypha that we have all of these little crystalline kinds of structures on the outside. This is oxalic acid. And this oxalic acid produced by the fungi, these crystalline structures, are ways to tie up on the surface of the fungus all the calcium in that sample. Of the soluble nutrients that come anywhere near that fungal hypha are going to be found on that oxalate. So the fungus is, well, it's putting in the pantry. The fungus says, well, I don't need all this calcium right now, so I'm just going to store it in the pantry out here. So when I need it, it just reaches out and grabs the calcium, or the zinc, or the boron, or the iron, or the potassium, or whatever it needs. But then when we look at that fungus with our eyeballs, not through the microscope, but with our eyeballs, it looks white. Thank you. Okay? Now, there is a difference in appearance between things that are hyaline, and things that are sequestering these compounds on their surfaces. So when we're looking at sequestered material, it's truly white. When we're looking at kind of clear, fuzzy, wuzzy fungi that don't really have a strong white color to them, those are the bad guys. Yeah, so, you know, I think there are many situations where people put that rice out into situations that aren't really healthy. And because that's a sterile or doesn't have much biology in the rice, we're getting some real bad guys growing on the rice. So how do you know? So you know, the, you're going to have a couple of microscopes. How how often do people come here and borrow those microscopes and they come in? Well, then on the other hand, you're available and you've got a lot of experience in this. So why not bring your samples to her? If you uh, you know uh, what? Well, we go on. I think you just kind of convinced me that I should get a couple microscopes here in case farmers want to come in and yeah. um, you know, use it. Like, oh, you know, <coughs> set, set something up. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, and you, you're not that far away, so, you know, you're not, can y'all come in and help? Uh, practice yourselves. It's like we will spend Friday learning all these different things in our soils. But then it's like, a, yeah, I can show you scales and I can show you how to use music, but then how do you become a pianist? Practice, practice, practice. The more you can be here, the more you can work on this. So can we set up a business where we do these things for people who need to have this knowledge? Mm -hmm.
ask questions about the white. What happens if you see red or black or gray? What is that? Those are all good guys. Anything that's colored. So golden, yellow, orange, raspberry, red, pink, purple. Um, every other color that I've ever seen, they're all beneficial sunshine. A really wide diameter typically. Now what causes the red color? The fungus likes to, those fungal species like to put reduced iron on their surfaces. So they have just absolute crystals that they're holding on to uh, reduce iron. The purple color, we've got, Remember, it's a permanganate uh, that is clusters on the surface. So all these colors, are they the what particular chemicals are they binding and holding? Well, it means you're removing salts from your soil. When these fungi tie up those soluble inorganic materials, we're taking salt out of your soil. You want to be dealing with a salt environment, you've got some problems with fields right on the edge of the ocean. Get some of these good guy fungi into your soils to tie up the socks. So they no longer damage your plant. So there's a lot of remediation work that's going on. I don't know how many of you maybe know Paul Stamets. And uh, he has a great book called Mycelium Running. <laughs> and he talks about the work that he and a little bit of myself have been doing with remediation of all kinds of toxic materials radioactive materials, um, taking those things out of the soil and sequestering them to the surface of the fungi. So a great way to take toxic materials out of your soil is heavy metals of any kind. There's a lot of work going on in uh, France, in Cetics. In France, it's terrible to have an institute that's in Nice. How, how horrible would it be that working on Mediterranean? So, um, in Nice, they're looking at a lot of these kinds of things. Trees, get the trees to grow roots down through the soil, colonized by some really beneficial fungi that have this oxidability and other kinds of sequestering agents on their surfaces. And that will pull out of the soil chromium, pulls out of the soil lead, zinc, arsenic. Different fungal species choose different kinds of heavy metals. So this tree is colonized with this mycorrhizal fungus that pulls out the lead. So now the tree has grown two, three years. You go in and dig up the tree. You cut the top of the tree, go do something else with it. Pull that tree up, kind of shake the soil out gently. You take that root system and you incinerate it in an incinerator. And now you have a pure lead left over after you incinerate. You sell that. How do we clean up soils from all of these heavy metals, from all these types of materials? We use biology to do it. And there's a number of instances where it's working really well. Um, and some of the radioactive situations in Japan and at uh, Chernobyl, uh, the only food that was edible after <coughs> radioactivity um, being impacted into the soil the only food that you could eat that did not have radioactive iodine, or radioactive strontium in it, were foods that had good mycorrhizal fungi in the root system. All the radioactive materials were sequestered by the fungus. They were in the soil around the, um, the plant, but when you took um, some of the material from that soil, the carrots, the turnips, the beets, the strawberries, the, you know, just whole slew of different kinds of plant materials, no radioactivity in the part of the plant that you and I would eat. It was still in the soil, but it was prevented from moving into the food that you and I eat because the proper biology was in the system. Only organic systems have the, that kind of biology. Oh, that, that detoxing, is it bacterial also or mostly fungal? Most of the data that we have is that it's fungal. Nobody's really demonstrated that bacteria on its own can have these kinds of effects. On the other hand, the whole science of soil biology is in such a state of infancy. We know more about the stars in the sky than we know about the life under our feet. So could we take a little of that money and pick it down there? Which ones? <laughs> Not necessary, but yeah, it's a little depressing how much money is 
not spent on the biology in the soil, and yet what is each and every one of us dependent on? How many of us depend on the number of stars in the sky? What are we going to use up for girl plants? Yeah. 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 The light coming from stars here. <laughs> Jeanette is really important in <coughs> So what else is in this picture that, now, think about this. This, uh, that fungus looks very much like this fungus, right? Uh, wait a minute, why? Is that a fungus? It, it doesn't look like it gets narrower and turns to that. Focus on the strand. This is very much out of focus. So when you're looking at that fungal hypha, it's sitting in that sample like this, and we're focused down here. So as this bit comes closer and closer and closer to you, it basically disappears until you focus. And then you realize that this is indeed the same diameter all the way along there. When you're using your microscopes, don't make that mistake. You gotta focus. We're looking at the depth of that liquid. And you gotta remember to focus from the top of your sample all the way down through it. Now back up, up and down, up and down. So this fungal hypha, it looks very much like these fungal hyphae. Is this the same individual? What's the size of the largest organism on this planet? It's a fungus. Who's the current winner? Ooh, you didn't know we had competition in the world of mycology. Who's the current winner? Who are the contenders? Washington, uh, Michigan State University, University of Washington, Cornell, uh, uh, Auburn, uh, Harvard, of course, they were the end of the uh, And of course, Paul Stamets. We have uh, people from the University of um, Helsinki. We have people from Greece. Uh, of course, the French are in on this. I'm a fungus, so they must run on the planet. <laughs> Who's the current winner? Paul Stamets. His, in his last report to me, he had students going out measuring the diameter of this single fungal hypha in the old growth forest up in Washington State, up on the Olympic Peninsula. This one individual fungus is 20 miles. <laughs> and it goes from everywhere from just a couple inches down into the soil as deep as 20, 25 feet. Well, they stopped there because it was too expensive to go any further. Is there a possibility that that fungus goes deeper? Sure. That fungus is the size of, uh, I think, the last time Paul estimated this to me. He estimated it was the size of eight blue whales. Uh, bigger than any other known organism. Same individual, who cares? So same species performing the same function, absolutely. What we want to know is the biomass of the fungi in there. We want to know the biomass of the bacteria. Is there more fungus? Is there more bacteria in this picture? We're going to have to do some measurements. We're going to have to do some counting. So there's a question now? Can you answer that? Okay. And it's just, is it individual or species? Yep. The chance that it's individual is pretty high. Species. How is Paul figuring out that this is one yeah. individual? Yeah. He's doing DNA analysis. So every bit of that genetic material from the center of that fungal hypha, fungal individual, out the road to 20 miles out, he's checking and making sure that it is the same individual because the DNA sequence and those chromosomes are exactly the same throughout that whole volume of that organism. And when you say the size of eight blue whales, I mean if you're to take all the hyphae and squeeze it together. You're gonna to measure all of the fungal biomass here. Measure the biomass of that whale. We've got eight times the largest blue whale on the planet. So it wins, hands down, because it's the largest organism on the planet. So can you say sometimes that a fungi can be particular for one valley or one geologic area? So because a lot of what natural farming does is it looks at a certain agricultural zone, and you don't want to start putting that fungi into another valley because you're working against. Could that 
can, I, I don't worry too much about this valley versus that valley, unless the environmental conditions are just wildly different. Why it is. We, oh, that's true. This part of the world. This side of the island versus that side of the island. Woo, don't take the stuff from over here, over there. You're probably not going to see much benefit. Because these organisms are adapted to this environment. Uh, over there, it's a wildly different environment. Way drier, you know, you need, you need organisms that are adapted. So I think the idea of going out with your rice and getting your local indigenous organisms to grow from your own property, already adapted to your conditions. Why reinvent the wheel? Use the organisms that are already out there. Now you gotta grow them up to really high, large numbers, mm -hmm. or at least enough that you could take a ton of that material and spread it over an acre of your land. It's an inoculum. We only need a dusting out there. But we really need to get organisms back into our soil because for the last 60 to 100 years, we have been wiping them out at a really frightening rate. I just have an um, analogous question going in my head about if, if you're sampling from your garden that you've already grown things in. Um, What's the likelihood that one sample is going to have anything to do with a sample six inches away or six feet away? You have to think about the disturbances that you've imposed on that soil. Where have you tilled? Where have you left it alone? Uh, where did you grow the tomatoes? Where did you grow the broccoli? Where did you grow corn? Because the life that's the change, change facial micro system in that yeah. soil. So, so we've imposed a lot of variability in very yeah. small areas. So you take a sample from your corn row and from your tomato row and from your broccoli row and mix them together, what's that going to tell you? Not much. It's going to give you a sum of tomato, corn, and broccoli. And they're probably very different. And I don't even do rows anymore. You know, it's just like a scatter of different things. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether this microscopic analysis is being You can go to a plant and you're going to sample from that plant and find out what's in that root system. Is it growing in a healthy fashion? Yes. And you might think, okay, all my other broccoli, mm -hmm. I really should be trying to get the biology, so take a sample from that other broccoli and that one and that one and that one. So just sample where the plants maybe are doing so well. Yeah, sample the ones that are, are really doing horrifically because that Mother Nature is saying, uh, this is not the right soil for yeah. broccoli. What is it good for? And so then let's equal the sense for those plants in that area. Or let's be altering the biology <coughs> in that soil so it is good for broccoli. Yeah. We could do that. That might take more effort though. So how much time and effort did you want to put into your garden? How much fooling around with Mother Nature do you want to do? It's not nice to fool Mother Nature. <laughs> Remember that butter commercial? <laughs> yeah, so which way are you going to go? You're going to put a plant in there that is needing that mix of organisms in order to do really well, or are we going to alter the biology in that soil to bring it to the plant you want it there? It's your choice. Do what you want to do. I really don't have any problem going in either direction. Mm -hmm. Just realize that sometimes forcing biology can be a little bit more difficult to achieve your ends. And so what is the balances for different kinds of plants? And what we'll go through is this whole idea of succession. There are plants early in succession, and they all need more or less the same kind of balance of fungi, bacteria, herbs, and nematodes, microarthropods, microbes, and fungi. So a group goes together. And we go a little bit later, and that balance changes. So a group goes dies together. A little bit later in succession, a group goes together. A little bit later in succession. So your old growth part of your property is over here now, all your old growth plants. Here's where your shrubs are. You know, the biology here is, needs to be pretty much the same. And then here we've got our veggies, and here's we've got, we've got our pasture, and over here we've got our weed land. Do you eat? Uh, most of us don't really appreciate them, but um, 
If we have a catastrophic disturbance, we then have to go back through the weed stage of life to build the biology. So when you really think about a watershed, we need all stages of succession within that watershed. Because if there's a catastrophic problem, uh, what if the volcano goes up? And we wipe out the section, this watershed, everything's going to have to go back to succession. And everything starts with weeds. Step, step one. Well, if we came out there, well, how many tons of compost would you have to put out in a watershed? <laughs> so, you know, sometimes we do let Mother Nature do things. And it might take a little while to she back in. So looking at the biology in our soils, now we've got bacteria, fungi, few protozoa, but we don't have them all yet. So let's keep going. Numbers, fern versus biomass. Now here's another thing that's an awful lot like species versus individuals. What's more important to understand? Well, numbers of bacteria. Go back. How many bacteria in this picture? I don't even want to think about counting them all. Uh, in this one little aggregate right here, how many bacteria? A thousand. So when we're looking at this kind of dilution, counting bacteria will just drive nuts. So what we actually do when we're looking at this kind of material, and if we really need to know exactly how many bacteria we have, and a lot of times we do want to know that balance, the fungi and bacteria, we're going to dilute the sample more. So we have our one gram of soil that we added um, four mils of water, so one to five dilution. Now we'll go back to that same test tube and we'll add five more mils of water. One gram of our soil, then nine mils of water, and one to ten dilution. So for John Friday, we will be going over this more. So when we're looking at dilution, we're looking at the volume of our sample divided by the total volume once we've done our dilution. So if the volume of our sample is one gram or one milliliter, they're the same thing, it's one cubic centimeter. And we put that one gram plus four mils of water, then our dilution is one to five. Well, if we now add five more mils, then it's one gram of our sample into one gram of our sample plus nine mils. Now what's the dilution? One to ten. So if we take one mil of this, put in another test tube and add 9 more mils of water. We've diluted that 1 to 100. What if we take our 1 to 100, 1 mil of our 1 to 100 and add another 9 mils of water? Now it's in dilution. Go 1,000. Make it easy on yourself. Go in um, jumps of 10. So we go and look at the 1 to 1,000 sample. Wow, there's still too many bacteria to count. We go to the 1 to 10,000. There's still too many bacteria. I don't want to have to count all that. Now we go to the one to a million dilution. And we've got somewhere between 30 and 50 bacteria per field of view. It's pretty easy to go, yeah, 30. And write that down. Because really it's the dilution you need to know. So if we had 30 bacteria per field, well, let's do more than one field. So we do mean an average. So on average, in 10 fields, we had 45 bacteria per field. But our dilution factor is 1 to a million. How many bacteria? 45. Yeah. So now we've got 45 million bacteria per field. Now how many fields in that one drop of water that we looked at? 1,650. So let's just round this up to 2,000. Is that good enough for you? So another two zeros. And 
So now this is 90. Now we have 9 billion bacteria. But that's in one drop. How many drops in a mill? So we get to multiply by 20. We run this to 100 and just go. How many zeros are we dealing with here?
So you can select for these best, most beneficial fungi, and then handfuls of this go into your compost pile when you start your compost. So you make sure you've got these really good guys in there. So why not have a pile of paper and wood chips and maybe a little bit of straw in here and maybe a little bit of wide C to N ratio materials. Difficult to decompose. You're going to select for these good guy fungi. Question. Is it possible for you to characterize what a sample that had um, bad fungi growing in it would look to the eye? You probably wouldn't see them. Because uh, the bad guy fungi don't produce these kinds of structures. They don't have this rising force. And if you get them growing really fast, those bad guy fungi, are those things that are really fuzzy wuzzy? And like molds? Yeah. Uh, if you talk to a mycologist, they will giggle at you when you talk when you say that word mold. There's no such thing in the world of mycology. Now, soil pathologists, whole different group of people, they use the word molds all the time. So you can see where the mycologists and the soils people kind of yeah, they don't speak to each other. You gotta love that. So um, <laughs> molds, I always kind of cringe when somebody says molds. What is a mold? It's a fungus. It just happens to be a pathogenic fungi. They are very narrow in diameter, clear in color. So when you're looking at very clear looking fungi, fuzzy, wuzzy, you don't see any nice thick strands, probably worry that it's a disease causing fungus. Another clue for you, pick up a piece of this organic material, so pick up this wood chip. And when you pick this up, all of this material comes with. So as you pick this up, you kind of feel like it's a, Wind, um, wind chimes. All these other little bits and pieces of wood chip, of the organic material, are hanging in together because of the strands of fungi. And then you know you've got a good guy. You see a bunch of, well, it kind of looks like fuzz, but you're not really sure. Try to pick up a piece, an edge of wood chip or a piece of that organic material and pick it up. And when you're standing there with just that piece of organic matter, none of it came with, because those fungi are too fragile to hold anything together. Now, what kind of disease-causing fungus is this? Sort of like asking what color was Washington's white horse? <laughs> it's a disease-causing fungus. And that's probably the most important thing. You don't want it anywhere near your plants, because What's that disease causing fungus going to do to your root system or your leaves or your flowers or your. Not good. So there's some simple ways for you to be telling the differences between what you do want and what you don't want. So you said that they're clear, the disease causing ones. Are you talking about under the microscope? Right. And they're black, mold. I mean, like the black that you see that's when we call mold, we not have color. So when you, yeah, so think about that orange in your refrigerator, and you look at it and now it looks like it's got a layer of black on it. You're looking at the spores. So on the end of each of those fungal hyphae, so here's that, you know, lots and lots of strands of very narrow, clear fungal hyphae growing on the surface of the fruit. But it's not going to sporulate, and it's producing these little fruiting bodies. And that's when they have the black color. Or if you're looking at something that's all green on the surface, you're looking at the fruiting structures, you're looking at the spores. If you looked at it two or three days earlier, it would have been just white, fuzzy stuff. No thick strands, no nice, nothing like this. You're just looking at fuzz, and then when, it's, when it goes into spore formation, so what are all the spores going to do to the food in the rest of your refrigerator? Everything is going to be black and not too long. So the black color, we're looking at specific species, or the green color is penicillium, or mycotrichoderma, or any one of a number of things that are food spoilage. But, but the good fungi don't, don't do that. Don't do that. They don't grow that fast. So the disease stops the fungi grow very rapidly because those are only folks in life. Hey, we're Collectors and they do a great job of composing things. 
to set free for me, that's not a desirable situation where food has been wiped out. Question? You can talk about speed of growth on some of the negative ones. What, what are we looking at to see as growth wise for a benefit of the longest week? Can you see and develop a culture of it in less than a week? Or is it? Yeah. And so these things can start growing. For you to have this extensive of growth of these really beneficial fungi, it's going to take a month, maybe two, to see this. But it happens pretty rapidly. Just give it a little bit of time to go. This was a golf course in uh, Devon, in England. Uh, a golf course superintendent that was going to lose his job because the greens look really pretty bad. Lots of disease, lots of insect problems. And so, you know, he wanted to be the first organic golf course in England. So he came to us 